Hi, thanks so much for joining me once again. My name is Randall Loy and I'm an infertility specialist in Orlando, Florida. Today we're talking about a technique that's not that many years old. It's called intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI. ICSI means we take a single sperm cell backloaded tail first and in the IVF setting we inject that into the egg cell. Now ICSI was developed in Brussels by doctors Palermo, DeVroy, and Van Sturtigam with the first baby in the early 1990s, 1991 exactly. And by 1992, the Reproductive Biology Associates in Atlanta, Dr. Michael Tucker and Dr. Joe Massey there and their colleagues reported on the first American birth. In our clinic, our first ICSI case was actually 1994. Now, this is used for male factor infertility, whether a man has a very, very low sperm count, a low percentage of normal forms, or a low percentage of moving forms. It's also necessary, of course, in those cases where we have to do a testicular biopsy, meaning taking a little piece of the testis and extracting those few hundred sperm, or whether we have to place a needle into the storage tank, the epididymis, to remove sperm that way. So if we're using sperm from the testis or from the storage tank, we have to use this direct sperm injection technique. It's done under a very sophisticated microscopic system. It's called a micro manipulator, which gives us three different levels of adjustment. Now some of those adjustments are so fine that they are on the order of microns, millionths of meters. And we're able to take a glass micro needle that is finer than a human hair. It's about four millionths of a meter in diameter. We take a holding pipette, apply gentle negative pressure, little suction on this side of the egg, and we line up the needle, it comes in like this, and we inject that single sperm, and then we remove the needle, and there's about a 70% chance that every mature egg is going to fertilize by ICSI. Are there complications with ICSI or with IVF itself? We know that the patient population we treat have more problems and that their babies will have more problems than a younger background fertile population. But could it be that IVF or ICSI is causing a problem as well? We have to ask ourselves, is it the treatment or is it the treated? Is it that glass microneedle or the patient? And if there's no problem with it, why wouldn't we do it 100% of the time? I think that's a great question because we don't have long-term data on this technique. It's only been around since 1991. We don't have any 30 or 40 or 50 year olds walking around. So we need more data to really answer that question. Having said that, some IVF clinics actually do perform ICSI on 100% of the eggs. Others don't think that's appropriate. One thing we do need to talk about is the fact that if a man has a little bit of his Y chromosome missing, a so-called Y chromosome microdeletion, he can pass that on to his male offspring. The little bit of DNA missing from the Y chromosome is what's causing the low sperm count and motility and maybe other problems. So if in fact a son born through ICSI also has this Y chromosome microdeletion, he may need ICSI 25 or 30 years down the road. So some recent tests have shown that certain markers for Down syndrome that are typically done in the first trimester of a woman's pregnancy might be elevated in babies conceived through ICSI. That doesn't of course mean these babies have Down syndrome, but the marker is elevated in some of them and it's a false positive. OBGYNs really need to be made aware of babies who are conceived through ICSI so they know how to best interpret those tests. Now a little story. A physician friend and I were at a medical meeting in San Francisco some years ago and he had heard about a famous fortune cookie factory. And we spent probably an hour up and down the streets of Chinatown trying to find this little place. There was no sign and we just kept asking store to store to store, where is the fortune cookie factory? and we didn't really understand a lot, so we, we were really circuitous in finding the place. There was this little hole in the wall, a couple steps down, and there were these four ancient Chinese women, well into their 80s it seemed, tiny little things, as quick as the eye could see. They were putting, you know, putting the fortunes in these cookies, and I asked one of the ladies, I said, we'd like to buy some fortune cookie. Now they were heaped up bags, thousands of bags it seemed like, of fortune cookies in the background, and I said, we'd like to buy some fortune cookies, and the one little lady with the cigarette hanging out her mouth said, crina dirty. And I said, excuse me? We looked at each other. I said, what did, what did you say? I don't know. She goes, crena dirty. I don't know what that means. Crena dirty. So I said, 
I'm sorry. And finally, her granddaughter, who was about 16, says, my grandma wants to know if you want the clean or dirty ones. I said, well, I thought they're all clean. I, I, I want clean ones, of course. And she goes, no, that means G-rated or R-rated. So my friend says, well, let's take a bag of both and compare them. So he was a reproductive endocrinologist, still is. So he opened up the very first R-rated fortune cookie and he pulls out the fortune and he read it and it read, insemination is copulation without representation. I guess that's what we do. Thanks so much for joining us today. See you next week, I hope. Please subscribe if you haven't already. If you have comments or questions of a personal nature, please email me at the address below. Thanks again. See you next week.